So thanks very much, everybody, for, for coming this evening. Um, my name is Rory Collins. I'm the head of the Nuffield Department of Population Health Science, which was created uh, just over two years ago, uh, bringing together the, the old Department of Public Health, uh, the Cancer Epidemiology Unit, and the Clinical Trial Service Unit, in which um, uh, Sarah Parrish has worked for more than 30 years. Uh, I know that, and it's a number that sort of sticks in my mind because I think she was here when I arrived, uh, which is more than 30 years ago. Um, and um, these inaugural lectures which we introduced for the uh, new uh, professors in the department uh, have, at least from my point of view, been incredibly enjoyable. But, but this one is, is really personally very enjoyable because, as I say, uh, Sarah was in the clinical trial service unit when I came. Uh, and I ha started working with her when I came here, and I've continued working with her throughout that period. And um, what I've always admired uh, about her and her work um, is her rigor, um, uh, even when you want to be a little bit less rigorous, um, <laughs> her precision, um, and the quality of everything that she does. Um, uh, with, I think, um, one, one exception, and that is it's been incredibly difficult over the years to persuade her of just how good she is. Um, and so I was you know, really delighted when the university um, uh, persuaded her uh, that she is as good as she is by making her a, a professor. And it's long overdue, um, but uh, all good things come to those who wait. So uh, We've all waited a long time for Sarah to be made a professor, um, and uh, it's really great to be able to celebrate that with her talk on hearts, minds, and lives. Sarah. Well, thank you very much, Rory, for that introduction. Um, as Rory said, I've been in the unit a long time. Um, I, first <laughs> I first started to work with Richard uh, in the late 1970s. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd graduated, uh, I graduated from math, uh, in maths from Bristol and was doing a, a DPhil with John Kingman in the Maths Institute. But I was interested in working in a applying sort of probabilistic models in a, a medical field. And uh, Richard was um, giving a talk on models for cancer. So I tracked him down, uh, and he had plenty of data waiting to be analysed, so he, he snapped up the opportunity of having a math student work on his data. Um, in those <laughs> days... Uh, in those days, we didn't have any computers in the department, nor any internet. So we used to have to walk over to the university computer centre to use the university computer and bring back our line printer output. Uh, the unit had about six people in it at that time. Uh, Richard Gray and um, Sue Richards and uh, Barbara Hafner, I think, were around in the unit, and, and um, Jill Borum and Cathy Harwood were, um, in, were, were around in other, working with other teams. At that time, the death from heart disease and stroke in middle age, that is before age 70, was very high. 16% of people were dying from these causes. And Richard realised that what was, there, there were promising treatments around uh, being, being considered um, but the trials that were being done were too small to detect the moderate, moderate, um, plausible moderate benefits. And Richard realised that what was needed was large, simple trials. So he began a collaboration with cardiologist Peter Slight and DPhil student Salim Yusuf. And they began a pilot study of intravenous beta blockers in acute heart attack. Uh, but they were aiming for a study 10 times larger than most people were doing in those days, 20,000 patients rather than 2,000 patients. Intravenous beta blockers um, had been shown to reduce uh, markers of heart attack size, but
but a trial was needed to see their effect on clinical outcomes. So it's not easy to get funding to do a study that's ten times larger than most people are, the studies most people are doing. So the trial had to start with a pretend target of 6,000 patients. Rory joined at the, at, the, at the start of the main trial. While the ISIS trial was going on, another promising treatment that was around was aspirin for the prevention of further heart attacks in patients who'd already had one heart attack. Five small trials had shown promising results, but none of them was individually significant for, for um, total mortality. And the largest trial, AMIS, which was nearly as large as all the others put together, showed an apparently null result. This was an expensive trial that had been conducted by the National Heart and Lung Institute in America, costing $17 million, and it had been expected to settle the issue. Even with Mavis's null result, a combination of all the trials showed a, statist a statistically significant benefit, uh, but Meta-analysis had not been established in the medical field at that time, and the combined and, and people wanted a significant result for overall mortality. There were clues in the Amos report that there might be a, a progno an imbalance of prognostic features between the two arms in the Amos trial. So Richard persuaded the investigators to send us their data and a mag tape arrived for me to analyse. <laughs> and we did indeed find that the prognostic features were stacked against the aspirin group somewhat by an amount that was com consistent with chance but affecting the results a bit. So when we adjusted for this your Amos adjusted result here, it tweaked the overall mortality result just enough to be statistically significant. And our meta-analysis findings were submitted to the FDA in 1983, and as a result of this, in 1985, the FDA issued an approval for, for aspirin use post-heart attack. And that was the first time the FDA had is issued a, a, a prescription labelling based on a meta-analysis result. Since then, many more trials of aspirin have been done and confirmed a 20% benefit uh, uh, for major vascular events. Uh, and and uh, meta-analysis conducted by the vascular overgroup here at CTSU have further clarified, the, uh, shown that it's beneficial in a wide range of patients. And 30 years on, aspirin is still a key component of secondary prevention. ISIS-1 completed, having successfully recruited 16,000 patients. ISIS-1 was an important trial, not so much because of its result, but because it showed that large, simple trials were possible. And it triggered much larger trials, not just here at CTSU, but worldwide. Rory became a co-director with, with, with Richard and it, by this time the unit had become called the CTS, the, the Clinical Trial Service Unit. With the benefit of aspirin clearer, our next trial in acute MI, ISIS-2, was designed as a two by two factorial trial of the clot buster streptokinase and aspirin. And Rory was the PI. Uh, it was designed to be very simple for, for clinicians at, at coronary care units. They just had to follow our wall poster, and the trial succeeded in recruiting 17,000 patients. ISIS 2 had a brilliant result. Uh, there was 
both, both its randomised treatments were associated with a 20 to 25 percent reduction in five-week mortality, and the combined treatment arm of streptokinase and aspirin had almost had over a 40 percent reduction in the five-week death rate. Uh, it was 13 percent died in the um, routine care double placebo group and 8% in the people who got both, are, both treatments. ISIS-2 had a dramatic effect on, on, on practice. A year later, two-thirds of doctors were routine, had routinely switched to giving these treatments to their heart attack patients. Following ISIS-2, we went on to do two larger and larger trials in acute heart attack with ISIS-4 recruiting nearly 60,000 patients in just two years. In ISIS-3 and ISIS-4, we had added on a large case control study by recruiting siblings and their spouses of the cases and getting a questionnaire and blood sample. The main aim was to look at the effect of smoking on heart, heart, heart attack. Heart attack was known to be associated with smoking, but there, was, there wasn't complete agreement on the extent of the causal association. The, the very large size of ISIS-3 and ISIS-4 meant that we had an exceptional number of young heart disease cases, so we were able to look separately by age group. So we're looking here at the ratio of heart attack rates in smokers versus non-smokers of the same age. And we found that in those under 40, there was a very high risk ratio for heart attack with a six-fold risk, a five-fold risk in the 40s, and a two-fold risk still in the older group. So we showed a very clear excess risk in the youngest age group, <coughs> which just had to be causal. By this time... Uh, deaths from heart attack and stroke were coming down, but were still 10%. 10 percent of people were still dying prematurely in middle age from these causes. Large prospective studies in Western populations showed that the usual cholesterol level was associated with an increased risk of, heart, heart, of, CA, of death from heart disease. And trial, large trials were beginning to emerge to show that amongst people with very high cholesterol levels to show that lowering LDL cholesterol for a few years with statin was beneficial. But epidemiological analysis, uh, studies in, in other populations, such as Chinese, showed that this relationship <coughs> extended down to much lower levels of cholesterol. So it seemed that a much wider range of patients might benefit from cholesterol lowering. So we undertook the heart protection study of simvastatin in a wider range of patients. And the results brought together here by the cholesterol treatment collaboration led by Colin Bajant uh, at CTSU with statistical lead John Emerson show that a 1.5 millimole per litre reduction in LDL cholesterol, which can be achieved with a standard dose of statin, was associated with about a 30% reduction in risk. Further studies compared more intensive treatment with um, lower doses and showed that the relationship continued and that more intensive treatment greater benefit. <laughs> the CTT meta-analysis were important in extending the knowledge to show how lower-risk lower groups of patients benefited and to confirm a lack of effect of statins on cancer.
HPS was 10 years hard work for many people in this room and search took another 10 years. So here are some of us at the end of the study at the results meeting enjoy, enjoying a celebration which was at the AHA, American Heart Association in Los Angeles in 2001 for HPS and was in 2008 for the search trial. So, moving on to now, during my time at CTSU, the death rate from heart disease and stroke has come down by a factor of, by, by four, by a factor of four, it's quartered, from 16% to 4%. I've mentioned some of the things that contributed to this. Smoking is an important factor. And people quitting smoking has probably been responsible for about half this reduction. I've mentioned better acute treatments with clot busters and aspirin, and I've mentioned long-term aspirin use and LDL lowering. Another very important risk factor is blood pressure lowering. Improved treatments emerged, and the prospective studies collaboration, led by Sarah Lewington, was important in, in demonstrating the importance of lowering blood pressure. Uh, with the 20 millimeter, 20 millimeters of mercury, lower blood pressure is associated with about a halving of risk. And death from heart, heart attack and stroke has been coming down in all age brackets. And so, in terms of vascular mortality, the rate now in the 70s is the same as it was at age 60 when I joined CTSU. So in terms of vascular mortality, 75 is the new 60. Is the job done? Well, looking at the biggest causes of death in the UK now in 2014, heart attack and stroke is still the second biggest cause of death at all ages. At CTSU, we've got two ongoing large-scale trials in vascular disease. The, re the reveal study of a different cholesterol-lowering treatment and the ASCEND trial of aspirin for the prevention of heart attacks and strokes in diabetic patients. But trials are getting harder to do because of the lower event rates from all the be beneficial treatments that are around, and some trials have stopped early due to fertility. So it's more important than ever to draw on the epidemiology to help design trials optimally. For example, to help choose the best choice of primary outcome that treatment benefits. And there's currently uncertainty about which types of stroke benefit from some vascular treatments. Blood pressure lowering is beneficial to all major types of stroke, but there's a debate surrounding cholesterol-lowering treatments. <coughs> Advances in technology have opened up uh, uh, new, new approaches that uh, have made new approaches feasible on a large scale in large-scale epidemiological studies. And two approaches that we are following are very large studies of genetic variants that parallel vascular, disease, vascular treatments, such as genes associated with um, lower LDL cholesterol or lower blood pressure. The genetic effects are usually quite small, so the studies need to be very large with tens of thousands of cases. We have, we have DNA and genetic data in some of the studies I've talked about in ISIS and HPS. And Gemma Hopewell has been taking this forward um, to, to, and contributing our data to large consortia. A second, a second approach is to, look at, to get a better understanding of disease pathways by looking at preclinical disease measures from imaging. And over the last year, we've been getting imaging data in a couple of studies. So I'm going to focus on this today. In the long term, our aim will be to combine both these approaches. Building on the infrastructure that was set up um, to, in the course of conducting the large clinical trials, CTSU has been instrumental in helping establish 
two prospective population biobank studies, each of half a million participants, in adults aged 40 to 70 or 80, and both with long-term follow-up by linkage to electronic health records. The China Kadori Biobank study, which is co-directed by Zen Ming Cheng here at CTSU and Living Li in China, and the UK Biobank study, which has Rory as, his, as its chief executive and principal investigator. These studies have been inquiring imaging. The China study has carotid artery imaging on, 20, on a subset of 25,000 participants, and UK Biobank is undertaking a program of imaging in various parts of the body and will have it on 100,000 participants by around 2020 and recently released data on about 4,500. Atherosclerosis, which is the clogging up of arteries with plaque, underlies most cardiovascular disease. In particular, LDL cholesterol is thought to act by causing plaque. <coughs> plaque is a focal thickening of the artery, which typically t contains a fatty deposit. The carotid artery is in the neck is readily accessible <coughs> to imaging, such as by ultrasound. And two measures of carotid atherosclerosis that are commonly used are the burden of carotid plaque and the carotid intima media thickness, basically the wall thickness. So in work I've been doing with Matthew Arnold and Robert Clark, we've looked at the risk factors, we've looked at the association of vascular risk factors with these carotid measures in the China Kadori study. In this study, Carotid measurements were measured about seven, at a resurvey seven years after the start of the study. Amongst people without prior heart attack or stroke, we found that the, these major risk factors, systolic blood pressure, bad cholesterol, smoking and diabetes, were similarly associated with wall thickness and with plaque. And blood pressure was the factor that was most strongly associated with both of them. <laughs> we've looked at the association of the wall thickness and the plaque with ischemic strokes occurring in the seven years prior, uh, prior to the carotid imaging measurements and in a joint model with wall thickness and plaque in the model together adjusted for those vascular risk factors that we saw we see that Plaque is strongly associated with ischemic stroke, but wall thickness is not independently associated. So plaque is the more important ma marker of ischemic stroke. The, the Kadori study has been subtyping strokes going back to the hospital records in a major effort led by Yiping Chen. Strokes may be in large arteries, such as the carotid artery or the cerebral artery, or in small arteries deep within the brain, also called lacuna strokes. So we've looked at the association of those two carotid measures with the two types of stroke. And you can see that plaque is most strongly associated with, with large artery stroke. And the distinction between the associations of plaque and, and the wall thickness is, is strongest for large artery stroke. So it looks as though there's a specific association between plaque and large artery stroke, and the other associations are probably largely due to the vascular risk factors. Returning to causes of death, now in, in, in the UK, another important cause of death was dementia, which is the cause of 10% of all deaths. Um, and obviously associated with that preceding death, there is a large burden on healthcare, a large social and healthcare burden of dementia. 
Much dementia includes both vascular and neurodegenerative pathologies. An important vascular cause of dementia is stroke, but in addition to clinically manifesting strokes, there may be subclinical vascular events, such as microinfarcts and microbleeds, which may contribute to dementia. Alzheimer's is associated with neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques, and both types of dementia are associated with shrinkage of brain volumes. So given that dementia is partly a vascular disease, have the age-specific rates of dementia in the UK come down over the last 35 years in parallel with the fourfold decline in vascular mortality? And have trials that reduced vascular events, such as the HPS trial, reduced cognitive decline? Well, to answer these, it's studying incidence rates of dementia is difficult because dis- dementia often occurs and is often uh, presented in conjunction with other comorbidities <coughs> and recording practices have changed. Furthermore, in epidemiological studies, response rates are typically worse in people with dementia. So that makes that very <coughs> difficult to assess and the limited evidence is not conclusive. Several trials that have reduced vascular events, including HPS, have assessed cognitive function at the end of the study but failed to detect a benefit. Why didn't they? What size of benefit would, they have, been expect- would, would have been expected? So we set about looking at that in our studies. And in three of our studies, HPS and SEARCH that I've already mentioned and THRIVE that I skipped over, um, we measured cognitive function at the end of the study using a verbal questionnaire called TIXM, which includes tests of memory, attention, calculation, orientation, etc. And we have 45,000 participants who've completed this questionnaire. We found that the cognitive score declined with age and to a similar extent in the different studies about 3.5% of standard deviation per year Um, but that was the mean there is this shaded area shows the variation of the population the shaded area shows the span that would encompass about two-thirds of the population. And you can see that the mean change (coughs) over 10 years is moderate compared with the variation in the population. We've used this relationship to to convert differences in cognitive score into years of cognitive ageing. I'm not going to go into the details but our association analysis which is an association analysis not a randomised comparison showed that having a stroke during the trials was associated with about 8 years of cognitive ageing and having various other events such as a mini stroke or TIA a heart attack or the onset of diabetes or hospitalisation for diabetes or heart failure Those other ones were associated with about two to three years of cognitive ageing. While having a revascularisation operation to open arteries was not associated with any cognitive ageing. So based on this, we estimated that the net expected from the vascular events avoided during the five-year statin trial would be about one and a half months cognitive ageing. So this would be too small for the trials to pick up using the type of cognitive measure that we've got. However, this is not necessarily, this benefit is not necessarily unworthwhile. Because the multiple (coughs) vascular protective changes that have contributed to the fourfold decline in vascular mortality that we've seen and which would apply over the whole of middle age and not just the five years of a trial, might well be expected to result in 20 or more times this effect. And so, a few years of cognitive ageing.
However, so this is just the, benefit, the, the effect expected from the clinical events avoided. Therapy might also avoid subclinical events, such as microbleeds or microinfarcts, which might contribute to dementia. But also, treatments might cause other benefit or harm towards dementia. So we want to be able to assess this properly in a randomised trial if we can. So we'll turn to the epidemiology to see if we can get any better ideas for a cognitive measure. UK Biobank has measured cognitive function in other way, uh, <coughs> cognitive measures in various ways. Cognitive function was measured in the whole population at baseline using <coughs> touch screen tests and that's also been repeated um, in a subset at various later points. And as I mentioned, it's got recently released brain imaging on 4,500 and will ultimately get it on 100,000. The tests of baseline included reaction time and pairs matching, which were conducted in the whole cohort, and prospective memory and fluid intelligence, which is a sort of combination of logic and calculation, though last two tests were introduced in about the last quarter of the recruitment. Both the Heart Perception Study and UK Biobank have long-term follow-up via a linkage to electronic health records. So we can look at the association of their cognitive scores with dementia, in, uh, hospitalisation with dementia. The cognitive score we're looking at here in UK Biobank is based on the two tests that are available in the majority of the population. So you can see we've got about 900 dementia cases in HPS and about 100 in UK Biobank. So although HPS is only 1 20th the size, it's higher risk, older people with longer follow-up make it more valuable for studying dementia right at the moment. Over here we can see that 10 years, 10 years of cognitive ageing, i.e. a cognitive ageing score that would be expected for someone 10 years older, is associated with about a 15% excess risk of hospitalisation for dementia. UK Biobank has also conducted brain imaging. Five different types with data on 4,500 participants in the first release of data, which was in December. From this, 700 image-derived <coughs> phenotypes have been made. In fact, the whole processing of the imaging data has done, been done by Steve Smith's group of the FRIMRIB functional MRI unit. And these derived measures, some of them are relatively simple to understand, like white matter and grey matter volumes in different parts of the brain but many of them are not that simple and would need specialist knowledge. <coughs> Nearly all the measures are massively associated with age. This shows one spot for each of the 700 <coughs> derived brain measures with the different colours coming either from different modes of imaging or from different regions of the brain. <coughs> the little red line at the bottom shows the level expected by chance. And over here on the left, in red, are the brain volume measures. So the imaging has only just been conducted in UK Biobank, so we can't look at the association between the imaging measures and dementia. We'll have to wait some years for that. And there's not a great deal of overlap with the genetic data at the moment either. But what we can do is look at the associations between the brain imaging measures and the cognitive measures. And we can see that fluid intelligence is strongly associated with several of the brain volume measures. The scale has changed slightly here. There's the red line's moved up a bit, but there's still lots of associations well above the red line. There? It's just one spot for each of the 26 okay. uh, brain volume markers. And reaction time 
also show some associations more weakly associated with the brain volume measures, but well above the, uh, the level expected by chance. Pairs matching and prospective memory don't show any association with the brain volumes with the amount of data that we've got so far. Brain imaging would be an ideal way of assessing the effects of vascular treatments on the brain at the end of our clinical trials. For example, we'd like to assess the effect of aspirin uh, at, at the end of the SEND trial, um, but how could we afford this? Sarah, can you tell me what fluid intelligence means? Does it mean what beer you prefer? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it does. That's not quite how they asked the question. Um, yeah, good cartoon to add into that next time. <laughs> You're only getting one professorship. Oh, right. <laughs> yes, this. I don't want to do this again, actually. <laughs> um, well, we estimate that 4,000 patients randomised into ascent were eligible by location and age to have been invited into UK Biobank. Um, and luckily, and, and because this end has been going on in parallel with the, the right timing, the, the imaging actually will be conducted at quite a good time towards the, you know, just before the end of ascend and, and after the end of ascend, shortly after the end of ascend. So we plan to, to explore whether we can link this with a view to making a randomised comparison of the effect of aspirin on brain imaging markers. And we've seen that the brain imaging markers are very powerful, so even an overlap of 500 might be worthwhile. <coughs> we know quite a lot about the uh, etiology of vascular disease and how to modify it, but we need to know more about how the vascular risk factors affect the brain. Much less is known about the etiology of Alzheimer's. But the exceptional resource that UK Biobank is building up with questionnaire, biochemistry and genetic data on the whole half million people with long-term follow-up to hospital records and incidents of dementia and brain imaging on a subset, one fi a fifth subset provides an unprecedented opportunity to identify new biomarkers of dementia. We've seen how study sizes have increased and how the types of data that can be achieved have increased. And all this needs, more, needs many more skills uh, than when I started, where we just used Fortran for all our analyses. So this is going to need highly collaborative approaches. So to sum up, the past 35 years and trials of studies have improved the chances of brain surviving well into old age, and the next 35 years need to improve the chances of brains working well in old age. These studies wouldn't have been possible without millions of participants giving their time and allowing their data to be shared. So I'd like to start by thanking them. The CTSU receives funding, core funding, from the Medical Research Council, the British Heart Foundation and Cancer Research UK. All the work I've presented is teamwork and I'm standing up here today representing team, the teamwork. So I'd like to thank <coughs> the members of my immediate team who conducted the uh, more recent statistical analyses that I've presented, um, Alison Offer, Matt, Matthew Arnold and Edith Peary. And I'd also like to mention the roles of Mike Lay, um, John M Jonathan Emerson and Gemma Hopewell, who joined CTSU about halfway through the period I've talked about. And developed to take over major programming and statistical roles from me, as well as go on to explore, to expand our directions of research in vascular disease. 
I, over the years, I've worked closely with many large teams. Um, the, and I'd like to thank the, the trials programming team, the trials clinical administrative team, many more people than I've shown here, but in particular, I've worked with Jill Barton since ISIS two days. Uh, I've worked closely with many, uh, several, with the lab teams over the years, and more recently I've worked with the China Kadori Biobank team. And in particular, and I'd also like to thank the, uh, my, clinic, my, my scientific colleague, colleagues from various disciplines that I've had the privilege of working with, and particularly Robert Clark on the epidemiology and Jane Armitage on trials. And of course, I'd particularly like to thank Richard and Rory for all, the, all I've learnt from them over the years and all the opportunities they've given me in the year so far and well into the future, I hope. Thank you all for coming today.